Right, um, I'm Julia Gogg, I'm Professor of Mathematical Biology here in Dampt in Centre for Mathematical Sciences in Cambridge. Um, can you tell us about this new project that you're involved with? <laughs> the BBC Pandemic. Um, this is awesome. Um, so we're making a TV programme together, um, but we've also got a big project gathering data. And the point is we want to understand a lot more about how people move so we can make better models uh, for pandemics and other infectious disease in the UK. The immediate outcome will be we'll be running some simulations of pandemics for a programme for BBC Four, um, which will be broadcast early in 2018. Um, but the other part is we'll be collecting the data so that we can study it and we can use it in science and it be available to other scientists. Uh, it's the first time we've been involved in something of this scale with an app involved. Um, there have been some other studies trying to understand the movement of people and mixing patterns using either a survey or using people's mobile phone movement, but none of them are quite like this. None of them are quite joined up in the same way. And we don't think any comparable studies are going to be near the scale of this one, and certainly not in the UK. OK, so th there's going to be a, a series of things we're going to need to do. The first is um, the app is anonymising to some extent by only being intrusive to square kilometre and per hour. We'll need to check that and make sure that really is anonymous enough and it's not that actually you can figure out who some people are. Um, if it's not anonymous enough, we'll have to scale it up to one level, level for example, to postcode like we're CB3 here. And do we lose too much by doing that, or is all the information there as far as we care for studying spread in the UK? Um, so we've got that data handling phase to get into good shape. We've got the producing stuff for the TV programme, which is a pandemic, and also showing what happens if we change it slightly. Um, and then finally, and, and this is the big one for us. Um, we've got permission and the terms and conditions that individuals are signing up for this data set will be made available to all scientists. And is that unusual to have this kind of data set available for other people to study? I don't know anything like it. Um, so there's a lot of interest from colleagues who have got in touch and said, oh, I've heard about this thing. Are you going to be publishing on this? Is there anything other people can have? And it's like, yeah, you can, you can have all of it. Um, we hope to write a paper on it sort of very early to show what it is and to say, please, please use this. Um, here's, here's how it's valid, here's how it's done, here's how it connects with other things. Off you go. And it'll be the BBC pandemic data set. Well, the big project we've been working on for the last few years is actually in the US and it's based on influenza-like illness and we're looking at the 2009 pandemic. And there, um, you want your models to be tractable simple enough so you can understand what's gone into them. And the temptation is just to put more and more detail in so you're tracking every, or you may, you've got to model how everyone moves, but if you put a few bonkers in there, things in there, you're going to get junk out. So it's easier to use um, things which are more transparent, and it's easier to use things that you can simulate quickly because you can do it repeatedly. So what we've been using so far is just a function of distance between two places. Um, and also whether the places are large or small, so both we call it the donor city, that the infection's coming from, and the recipient. Um, obviously, if either of those is big, it's going to be more likely to spread or be infectious or be susceptible. Um, you might care also whether, about whether there's other cities nearby, so two cities that are close together and they're reasonably small, but there's another big city here. Actually, those people might be commuting to that big place rather than to each other, whereas if they're off on their own, there's more likely to be interaction. So how you control for that uh, is another part of the modelling. And what we've been doing so far is because we've got the data set on the disease, is trying to fit these functions. And there are some accepted functional forms you try in this area. Um, but there's actually not many data sets motivating them. So we choose the ones that are reasonable. We fit them. Does it look like what happened? OK, we hope that's right. And then we'd say, what would happen if you change something? So what this will bring in is we'll then have a data set where we can say, OK, actually, people movement is like this and um, different age groups are like this. So if you change something like closing schools, it's not just reducing the population, it's changing this age group. Um, so we'll be able to do more sort of targeted effects and see what happens. Before you went from disease data to inferring movement functions, mm -hmm. So this time you're going the other way around? Yeah, and that's going to bring a whole new bunch of challenges with it. But one of the challenges is how one city infects another. It's not about one person, it's about all the people, which means we actually need quite a large and diverse data set to know 
what, are, what patterns of the city, I keep saying cities, but I'm also talking towns and villages as a whole. And um, actually, this has been an interesting one because I've got a lot of friends and family and colleagues who have downloaded the app. And a few of them have said to me, well, I didn't really want to do it today because today was not a typical day because um, I was off because I needed to do this or I spent the day in the hospital or it was weird for some other reason. And you start to think, how many people have told me that? Do any of us have a completely routine, our whole week, week looks the same? And actually, we need people just to download and use the app on whatever day. It doesn't matter which day. Just to get a picture of the sort of ensemble as a whole of how we're moving. So the team is a little bit of a damped home team. I think everyone, yeah, everyone has been in damped at some point. So the three of us who will be crunching the data are actually all here in damped at the moment. There's, there's me. And there's Stephen Kistler, who's just finishing his PhD and just become a research fellow. And there's Maria Tang, who started her PhD this term and will be doing some number crunching. Um, then we've also got Andrew Conlon, who's in the Department of Veterinary Medicine. Now, he was a postdoc here in Dampt before. Um, he has expertise particularly on gravity models. And there's Adam Kucharski, who's now at the London School of Hygiene Tropical Medicine. And he was previously a PhD student here in Dampt. And Petra Klepatz who was also a postdoc here before, and she's an expert on the, the UK um, maps and spatial systems. Actually, we've all brought slightly different things, but between us, we're hoping we have the skills to do it. Excellent. Talking about citizen science projects, you have some experience working with this kind of project. Um, would you like to tell us about that? Yeah, so this, the, the BBC Pandemic Project is pretty unusual for all of us involved um, because it's partly about making a TV programme, it's partly about uh, public awareness of things and explaining what the science is behind understanding how pandemics will work and how we design better control measures in the future. But there's a huge element which is the, the science itself gathering this data set and, and sharing it. And so putting together outreach and basic science is pretty unusual but we've done it once before so we had confidence this would work. Uh, this is a project we did through Millennium Maths Project and it was the Motivate unit of video conferences where this started. And with Jenny Gage and others, we are working uh, with several schools. And these secondary schools um, were visiting their local primary schools and collecting social network data. So again, it's not collecting health data or infection data, it was collecting data on how people are connected. They collected this and they analysed it. And it was partly about working with those schools and it was partly about making an amazing data set. And there, when we first started, if I'm honest, I really wasn't sure we'd get a beautiful data set, but that didn't matter because this was primarily the outreach. Data set was a secondary and both, both flew, both worked. So we had some confidence that this crazy idea uh, with the BBC pandemic might work as well, just different scale. So you, you published papers based on the Motivate data set? We did, you? yes. Um, and yeah, these are, these are referred to regularly and it shows how different school classes mix and how it changes with age and the different network patterns and the gender patterns which change in different age groups as well. Yeah. So is this, um, do you think this is perhaps a new avenue more researchers will go down, this idea of combining um, asking the everyday population to get involved with data collection as well as sort of so producing a data set but also the outreach side? I really hope so um, and I gave a, a talk at a, a straight science conference about the Motivate work saying look this is outreach but you have a possibility of doing so many things with it and you're going to be surprised if people are engaged it'll work um, and certainly I was stunned at what those school kids could do in the Motivate project so it'll be interesting to see what happens here. So when will we see the first um, results coming out of this? Ah, oh, so you'll have to wait until the TV programme. We're sw sworn to secrecy and silence on what we do or don't know uh, about the pandemic until then. So that's a secret within the team. Um, what we know already is there's been huge interest uh, and uh, you know, a lot of sparks of people wanting to download and, and do stuff. So I'm pretty confident it's going to work. Okay, well we look Can't tell you what's happened yet though. We look forward to uh, seeing the results in early 2018. Thank you. Thank you.